So we are continuing on in our next lesson, and this lesson is really a continuation of uh, a story uh, that has been narrated to us and recorded for us uh, by the Gospel writers Mark as well as Matthew. We are in Mark chapter 10, as well as Matthew 19. They're both telling the same story, but they're both telling it from different perspectives. And so what we've done, as we started last week, when Yeshua was in conversation with the Pharisees, is we've tried to take these two passages and lay them on top of one another so we can get a, a, a fuller idea or, of, uh, of, of what transpired that day. So we're, we're going to start it off in Mark 10, beginning in verse number 10, and the, the scene shifts. Uh, Yeshua is no longer speaking to the Pharisees. Now he's going to be addressing his disciples. And in Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 10, uh, the writer tells us, In the house the disciples began questioning him about this again. Well, of course, the topic uh, in question, right? D- uh, marriage, divorce. So in the house the disciples began questioning him again uh, about this again. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she herself divorces her husband and marries another man, she is committing adultery. So let's talk briefly about uh, culture, traditions, customs, those kind of things. Uh, Customs and traditions and cultures, they they are fine uh, as long as they complement the scriptures and do not contradict them. Once you have a a tradition um, or some kind of custom that contradicts the scripture, then that custom or that tradition must be thrown away. It cannot be used. Uh, One of the more well-known pharisaical customs of the day was washing, washing the hands before they would eat. Now, on the surface, there's certainly nothing wrong with washing your hands before you eat. And I do that practically every time um, before I eat or use some kind of sanitizer or something or other. So there's certainly nothing wrong with it. But if somebody was to tell me or if I was to tell someone else, well, you know, the, the food that you're eating, you did not wash your hands prior to eating the food, and therefore the food that you're eating is unclean. Well, you can't do that because that's simply not biblical. It's a custom, it's a tradition, but it certainly isn't biblical. You can't say that. Um, Another custom, uh, most people would not know, uh, it's uh, a a tradition, it's a custom, and that was praying before eating. Uh, There's no command anywhere in the Bible to pray or say grace before eating. In fact, in the book of Deuteronomy, it says when you've eaten and you're full, then you bless the Lord your God. But that's a Pharisaical tradition. The Pharisees started that tradition of praying for the food prior to eating it. And of course, that is a tradition that certainly complements the scriptures. And to this day, 2,000 years later, uh, most people pray uh, for their food. Most believers would pray for their food before eating it, probably not even knowing that it's a, it was a Pharisaical tradition. So where I'm going is these disciples grew up in a culture and in a society where the, 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 the traditions and the culture and the customs unfortunately did not take marriage, mar- marriage very seriously um, and uh, and therefore had a, 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 a wrong, th- wrong thinking in terms of divorce. And so now here's Yeshua on the scene, and he's teaching them something that was actually rather, uh, uh, that was contrary to, to society. Uh, keep in mind, uh, Herod, King Herod, had divorced his wife, Phasaelis, without the proper grounds. Uh, Herodias had 
managed a divorce with her husband, Philip, without the proper grounds, and then these two decided to get married. So neither one of them had the proper grounds, and then they go ahead and get married. Well, guess what? They're both committing adultery. So the Roman government may have looked at the marriage between Herod and Herodias and may have said it was okay, but God certainly did not. On the bottom of page 76, it must also be remembered that the divorce certificate of the first century carried with it the right to remarry. Behold, thou art permitted to any man. Meaning that no party could be accused of committing adultery following a divorce. Rabbi Yeshua rejects this provision because there is fault and blame on one or both of the participants. Whenever a divorce occurs, it stems from hardness of heart and pride on one, if not both, of the parties involved. So you can't say, and yet every single divorce certificate said it, you're permitted to marry any man. You're permitted to marry any woman. No, you're not. Unless you have the proper grounds, as far as God is concerned. The sanctity of the marriage covenant should be maintained at all costs for the sake of the one who brought the husband and wife together. Uh, Tim addresses this in, in his commentary uh, on page 77. In the middle of his, uh, his quote, I, I show you, it says, It is true, Tim writes, it is true that rabbinic law never allowed a wife to give a get or a bill of divorcement to her husband. But what is often overlooked is that a wife could appeal to the courts when she had a legal right to be divorced, in other words, to be free from her marriage obligations to her present husband. The seeds of this are found in the Torah itself. For instance, in Exodus 21, beginning at verse 7 and following, a woman who is sold as a slave and then purchased for the, uh, for the purpose of marriage has certain rights granted her. Apparently, if she is denied these rights, she has the ability to appeal to the court for justice. In rabbinic law, certain failures on the part of the husband could give the right of appeal to the court by his wife. These included his refusal of conjugal rights, his failure to provide for her physical needs, physical abuse, apostasy, fornication, restricting his wife from her legal rights, as well as other things. In such an appeal, if the wife proved her case, the court was obligated to require the husband to grant her a divorce. In practical measures, then, the wife pursued and obtained a divorce from her husband, and it appears from the Markan text that Yeshua agreed with such a procedure, that such a procedure was lawful. And of course he would agree with the procedure because it's based on Torah. And we looked at that way back in Exodus. So we studied the responsibilities of the husband, responsibilities of the wife, and if those responsibilities aren't being met, or there's abuse, physical, sexual, emotional, psychological, all of these kind of abuses, right? Witchcraft, um, drugs, alcohol, abuse, uh, any of those things. And there's so much more, right? Pornea. So many things fall under that banner. And that wife was able to show a court, this is what my husband is doing. The, co the court looked at the Torah, the, uh, looked back at the wife, and said, yes, we agree. The husband should give you a divorce, and that woman would be free to go. Dr. Keener, uh, he writes, he is, uh, he meaning, uh, of course, Yeshua, he is arguing for the sanctity of the marital union and arguing that it must not be dissolved under any circumstances. If it is dissolved, only the sinned against partner who did not dissolve it through adultery or an invalid divorce is free. This is the real point of Jesus' saying, do not break your marriage, nurture it, preserve it, live as one with your spouse as it was intended in the beginning. Well, let's look now, as this conversation continues, on over Matthew 19. So, in Matthew 19, verses 10 through 12, now that Yeshua has addressed their first question, the disciples said to him, If the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, 
it is better not to marry. <laughs> but he said to them, not all men can accept this statement, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to accept this, let him accept it. So, yes, marriage is a gift. But so is singleness. Singleness is a gift as well, when it's coming from God. On the bottom of page 77 I write, In response to the Master's teaching, that the intent of the Creator for the husband and wife in marriage was for them to remain together, through no matter the mitigating circumstances which may or may not have come their way during their covenantal union, the disciples fall upon the notion that it was then more advantageous overall if people not join in covenantal union. The disciples had envisioned the relationship between husband and wife as being some kind of torturous obligation, when in fact, if both partners share in the glory of the Lord in the same sacrificial manner, which Messiah sacrificed for his ecclesia, the body, the marital union can instead be one of harmony and bliss. Unfortunately, that's what we're looking at even in our own day and age. How many young people in this culture, in this society, look at marriage and say, man, I don't want that. I mean, why, why would I want to shackle myself to somebody else, to some fella or some, or some girl? Why would I want to do that? When most of these marriages just fall apart anyway. What's the use? What's the sense of it all? And, you're, and that kind of, of attitude and that kind of, of position, you're missing what God has in store and what God has always intended for marriage to be. And that's a picture to a lost and dying world of his unity, of the Godhead itself. And to, to be able to join together one flesh, working together, growing together, loving together, and serving the Lord together. So these disciples, remember, they were raised in a culture that didn't exactly raise up marriage up on a, uh, up on a, on a, on a platform. And Yeshua is telling them, hey guys, let, let's see what Moses has to say. Okay? He even told the Pharisees, what did Moses command you? Not about what Moses permitted, but what did Moses command you? Hey guys, listen. Let's get back to the Torah and let's see what Moses has to say concerning marriage and, unfortunately, at times, divorce. So let's put the culture aside and your idea of what marriage is, your idea of what divorce or what the culture is telling you, and let's just get back to the scriptures. At the top of page 78, I write, At this point, in his conversation with his disciples, Yeshua could have easily used the opportunity to scold his followers for their cynical approach to God's demands within the marriage covenant. But the master instead chooses to use the occasion as a positive teaching moment and approaches their pessimism by stating, not all men can accept this statement, but only those to whom it has been given. In other words, it is occasionally in the sovereign design and will of God for some people to live a life in which there will be no opportunity to enter into the marriage covenant with another person. And that's why he says, but only those to, to whom it has been given. Meaning that that is a situation which, which is dealt with between themselves and the Lord their God alone. It must be cautioned at this time, one cannot simply use this statement by Messiah as a blanket affidavit for those whose hearts have been anchored by the Spirit in doing the work of the Lord in public or private ministry. Contrary to what the Roman Catholic Church has insisted upon for centuries, and as the Scriptures do clearly attest to, there is no spiritual pl uh, plane which is achieved when one adopts a celibate lifestyle for ministerial purposes. And we know it's, it, it, that's, that's, what the, that's, that's what the Vatican's been, been hanging their hat on for years. And, of course, they're priests and, and so on and so on. But you can't, it, it's, it, you can't go ahead and take, let's say, marriage and say, yes, it's for everybody. But you can't say, well, 
you got it's singleness, and that's for everybody as well. Because marriage or singleness is a gift, and it comes from God. And as long as you are are in that in that state or in that condition, and that's the condition that God wants you in, then you will be blessed, and you'll be a blessing to Him. I mean, look at the apostles. All right, Peter was married. Paul was not. <laughs> and they're both apostles, and they both wrote letters, and those letters are in our Bibles, and they're God's Word. So, was Peter somehow a, a better apostle than Paul? Was Paul some kind of better apostle than Peter? Absolutely not. They're both apostles. And they were both called, uh, at that point in their lives, one being pro- uh, Paul, probably being a widower, and he was called into ministry. And Peter, of course, being a fisherman and being married, he was called into ministry. God knew exactly what he was doing. At the bottom of the page 78, Yeshua continues by stating, there are eunuchs. Eunuchoi is the word. And then he goes about and he, he divides the, these this term eunuchs and he divides them into three categories. The first one is eunuchs that are born that way from their mother's womb. So, if I may use the term their lot in life, or so to speak, um, because of some kind of uh, uh, physical issue, uh, lacking the proper genitalia, I think we can also put in that category uh, perhaps a, a, a man that doesn't have the, the proper sperm count or something wrong with a woman's egg or reproductive organ, something along those lines. You can put in that category they were born that way from their mother's womb. In other words, they're not going to be they're not going to be marrying and having a family with their spouse. Now they can certainly marry, but they're not going to be having a, a family, they're not going to be having children with that spouse. And you have to keep in mind as well that in that culture, uh, children were, dare I say, a necessity. Dare I say a necessity. Uh, especially for a woman, a woman to have a son, because it was the son, it was the oldest son's responsibility to take care of aging parents. So if you had a girl, well, God bless you, and that's wonderful. But when that girl gets of age, she's probably going to get married, and she's going to be helping her husband, her new husband, with taking care of his parents. The oldest son would take care of their parents. So there was parents were always being taken care of. But in a situation like this, there's no children to be had. So there you have this one category, those that were born, born that way from their mother's womb, and you can p- put all of those situations in that. Then he goes on, here's another one. Uh, then he goes on and he tells them, he informs his disciples, that there, there are those eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. Well, those are ones that were castrated. In some, uh, as we know, in the, in the ancient Near East, as bizarre as it would sound in our day and age, but in some cultures in the ancient Near East, they would take the men and they would just go ahead and castrate them, and those men were then used as officials in courts among royal women. We see that situation in the book of Esther. Of course, you have the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. So the first category, those that were born that way. The second category, those that were made that way by men. And then a third category. Simply, they made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. So it's more of a figurative sense instead of a literal one. Uh, and here we can go and we can, we can talk about this gift of singleness where... Uh, Someone is is content being single. They know the Lord. They love the Lord. And the Lord has placed this burden on their hearts to enter into ministry, probably more often than not a full-time ministry, maybe being a missionary, maybe being an emissary, some other place. And the thought of 
getting married and the thought of settling down and having children and, and playing with the grandchildren, that thought really doesn't enter their mind because they're so entrenched, really, in doing the Lord's work. And you can look, in a way, um, at the Apostle Paul following his, his salvific experience when he came to faith and I think it's safe to assume that he was a widower and he never did marry again and he, je- he lived the rest of his life, however many days there were, just doing the Lord's work and going out and proclaiming the good news and writing and discipling and all of those things. You would put him in that category. He made himself a eunuch for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Middle of page 79, Yeshua closes his drosh uh, by definitively and emphatically stating, he who is able to accept this, let him accept it. It is most unfortunate that in many a believing community, pressure is put upon those within the assembly who are in a state of singleness by those who have already entered into a state of matrimony. The single or divorced person is made to feel like an outcast or someone lesser in population and that they are quote-unquote missing out on the joys of life as they continue to exist in their single state. This is certainly not what the Lord Yeshua is teaching us in our passage here. On the contrary, Messiah reminds us that as a kingdom of priests to our God, the Lord may have a particular calling on our lives that is far different than those around us. Singleness should not be frowned upon as a detriment when serving the one who has graciously called us into a service. Nor should we frown upon ourselves in the marital state with which he has chosen us to serve in. So, again, if it's the state that the Lord wants you to be in, and as long as you're in that state, in that condition that he wants you to be in, whether it's married, whether it's single, whether it's divorce, a widow, widower, what have you, as long as you're walking with the Lord and as you're walking in his will, and that's what he wants for you. Singleness can be a gift, and marriage can be a gift. So, you know, you look at as what Yeshua had just spoken about as far as uh, eunuchs uh, who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. You can look at someone, let's say, uh, uh, perhaps a young person, and, and the Lord has really laid a burden on their life. And guess what? I want to enter into ministry and I'm not really concerned about uh, 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 settling down and being married and having children. I just want to do the Lord's work. And that's what the Lord wants from them. That's a blessing. Unfortunately, that's not what we have in our society. That's not what, and it's not what, what we're teaching our young people. We're teaching the young people. They're getting out of school. They're getting out of high school. Okay. Well, now what? Well, you can't. No, no, no. We don't want you getting married. No, you got to go off to college. See, you got to go off to college. You got to go off for two years or three years or do the four years. You can get a bachelor. Well, you can get your master's. You can get a doctorate. You can do all this. And well, what about marriage? Oh, no, you don't want to get married now because now you want your career. Got to have a career. And you got to make money. And now you're climbing the corporate ladder. Now you're 22. Now you're 23. You're going to get married? No, because I've got my career going. 25, 27. Well, I'm, cl- I'm, I'm trying to move up and everything. And I don't want to get married now. Or maybe I get married and I certainly don't want to have children. Because, oh man, there goes the career. The sad thing then is this when you really look at a situation like that. So someone goes ahead and that's the that's where the concentration is. I'm just gonna I'm j I'm gonna build my career. Well congratulations. You you built your career, you got your office, you got your name up on the monument somewhere, you made all that money. Great. And you die. And you leave it all behind. And then you really look and you stand at really at the judgment seat of Christ. And what do you have to offer? As you were building your kingdom and not really caring about his kingdom whatsoever. And you have nothing to offer the master. Uh, Michael J. Wilkins 
he writes on the, the bottom of page 79, he says, those who have chosen to remain single as the expression of the way that they believe they can best serve God need us as their community of brothers and sisters. Jesus declares that celibacy is an acceptable lifestyle for those for whom it has been given by God. Paul expands on Jesus' statement to indicate that if one remains unmarried, one is in a position to be undistracted by the amount of work that goes into taking care of one's family responsibilities. And the kingdom of God receives benefit. Unfortunately, many in our churches endorse marriage as a sign of maturity. And those who are married tend to get more responsible ministry opportunities in the church. Single people are seen as those who have not settled down. And we should reevaluate the way we view and value single people within our ministries. End quote. And that's well said. So the pendulum can swing the other way. Oh man, I'm single. And, and man, how is the Lord ever going to use me in my singleness? I need to find somebody. I need to find me a husband. I need to find me a wife. I need to... And if you keep looking and you keep looking, unfortunately, like the old phrase says, one of the worst things that can happen to you is God gives you what you want. Sit back, wait on Him, be patient. If God wants you to get married, He'll find the proper spouse. If God wants you to stay single... And, and you're willing to stay single and, and do that as long as you're in the will of God and you're walking with God. That's what's most important. Top of page 80, as we conclude this brief examination of Yeshua's views concerning marriage and divorce as chronicled for us by the synoptic writers, it becomes most apparent that the Master considered and ratifies marriage to be a binding covenant between one man and one woman as a covenant which was to be upheld and honored for the remainder of both spouses' lives, all for the glory of the Righteous One who had divinely placed them together for His purpose and His purpose alone. The marriage contract, from Yeshua's perspective, brought with it not only great responsibility upon the part of both partners within the covenant, but afforded both parties with certain unalienable rights. In accordance with the statutes which we have already analyzed in the Torah text, Yeshua agrees with Moses' decree that marriage is viewed upon by God as one flesh, and that the dubious grounds for divorce, which were being paraded around by the culture of Yeshua's day as well as by the Pharisaical opinions as recorded for us by the Synoptic writers, were nothing more than a sham which brought dishonor to the Creator who had initially instituted the marriage covenant as a testimony to the world of the unity which existed within the Godhead itself. Yeshua only agrees, as the scriptures have demonstrated time and time again, that the innocent party in a divorce is protected by the statutes of the Torah, and that the spouse who has been betrayed should not be treated as the one who has perpetrated the betrayal. Messiah continues to uphold the Torah mandate, that the one who has put away their spouse without the proper grounds is forever prohibited from marrying again. On the other hand, the spouse who has been put away unlawfully has the proper rights as dictated in the Torah to seek another marriage contract with someone else who properly respects and upholds the ways of God. We've said it over and over. It's not about the divorce. It's about the grounds. We all understand when a divorce happens, sin is there somehow on either the husband, the wife, or the husband and the wife. But God is not going to condemn the innocent party. And we have seen in the examples that the scriptures have given us, whether it's Deuteronomy 24, where you have a man divorcing his wife, he didn't have the proper grounds. You got Herod, he divorces his wife. He didn't have the proper grounds. You got Herodias, she's divorcing her husband. She didn't have the proper grounds. <laughs> Goodness. Final words from uh, David Garland in his NIV application commentary. He writes, Married couples soon learn that marriage is not a fairy tale. Live happily ever after in a castle. Romantic emotion, which may have been the only thing that drew the couple together, 
quickly wears thin within two years of marriage. Human hardness of heart has not softened since the time of Moses. Given the escalating divorce statistics in our country, the issue of divorce is constantly before us. Committed Christians also get divorced. Many suffer from anger, anguish, and guilt. Others take the shattered relationships with a spouse and the impaired relationships with their children in stride. The extraordinarily high divorce rate in our society reflects most people's belief that marriage is dissolvable at will. As a result, in 1973-1974, the number of marriages that ended in divorce exceeded for the first time the number of marriages that were ended by the death of a spouse. Many factors contribute to the rising tide of divorce. Couples who try to live on islands of intimacy, isolated from others, are more easily deluged when hit by the typhoons of trouble. Family members may be too distant to offer support, friends too few. The institution of marriage has changed from a predominantly socioeconomic one to something supposed to meet personal and emotional needs. We expect more from marriage than people did in the past. The vow to have and to hold as long as we both shall live has been updated to as long as my spouse meets my needs and I feel fulfilled. Well, we're going to close that lesson as we've looked at marriage and divorce as far as the Gospels are concerned. And when we come back together again, we're going to start to look at divorce in accordance to the words of the Apostle Paul.